Uh, welcome to actionable code coverage. Uh, this is a talk about uh, code coverage, its limitations. Um, this is not only a talk, it's also a repository with runnable examples uh, that basically shows you step by step how this was done. And it also has like marked down slides so you can modify them or maybe present it somewhere else. And it's basically meant as a deep dive for new developers to tell them like how we develop, how we test, and how we use coverage for that. I'm uh, Michael Grosser, I work at Zendesk, and we're hiring in San Francisco, Madison, Dublin, Copenhagen, and Sydney. Uh, we offer a great work-life uh, work balance and also visa, so come join us. And you can find me on all these social platforms. My job there is basically an infrastructure engineer, so I build a lot of these tools and help onboard uh, big projects onto them, and usually that means I have to like be careful not to break existing workflow and just like onboard them piece by piece. And that's basically what also this talk is about, how you can get a big project and like make it better step by step. Uh, the plan is basically to go over what code coverage in, in general is and to get everybody on the same level. Then how you can make your code coverage more actionable, uh, what the problems with the current approaches are, what solutions there are, and how to migrate big projects. Then how to hack fork coverage, because forks and, uh, and coverage don't play nice together. And then uh, a wish list for the Ruby maintainers of like what features we still need to make coverage uh, even better. Um, code coverage in general is a built-in C library, so you don't need any gem to use it. And out of the box, it's pretty, pretty much usable. So you could, if, if there none, no library existed at all, in like 10 minutes you could rig up a system that kind of gives you like 80% of what you need. Uh, you always have to enable it before you load any code, so you can't be like, oh, I'll load all my files and then I need coverage. So you have to like, basically your setup is always like require a bundle setup, then require your coverage tool, and then require all your other stuff. Uh, it's lost on execution, so don't enable it for production and don't enable it for your tests if you don't care about coverage. The simple form of coverage is line coverage. That's basically what you get by default when you turn it on. Uh, you basically turn on coverage, you require your code, you run your code, and then you ask for the result. Whoa. Where did that go? God oh, damn it. Um, that worked. Yes. Um, and then you ask for coverage for its result, but that will also disable coverage recording. Uh, you can use peak result to still keep recording coverage after that. The result of line coverage is um, a big hash of all the files you have loaded and what their coverages are. All the numbers are basically your hit counters. It means like how often this code was reached. And the nils are unreachable code, uh, things like end, else, comments, and all kind of these things that you can't really reach. Um, for an example code, uh, we see here that it's like 110 nil. It basically means the method, like the method definition was executed. That doesn't mean actually someone called this method, just like the method got defined. Then you have your first code, and here like the one equal two is not true, so we can never reach this code. So the, the if was executed, but the a was not because it's unreachable. Then the else is unreachable, and then the else branch was reached too, and from this it looks like, oh, everything is fine, everything is covered, but the else branch actually has two parts. So the B part is never reached, and line coverage is kind of lying to us. So it's like, it's a nice beginner's tool, but it's not really, it doesn't give you like the 100% the that you want. Um, so you could approach this by refactoring your code. You could say, okay, I'm not using like two things on one line, I'm split everything up. Uh, you could make a RuboCop rule that refactors your code automatically. Uh, but there's a better tool called branch coverage, which is available in Ruby 2.5. Um, it's basically you start it, tell it, oh, I want branch coverage. Um, it looks very easy, but it gives you kind of like a more complicated result if you are into like actually pausing the result. So it splits out all the branches you have and then tells you like from this character to that character it was covered. So that's why it breaks down uh, these single line things. Um, yeah, so basically it tells you like this is the start line, this is the end line, and then you know, okay, this section was covered. And here, for example, for the else branch we had earlier, 
you can see that the whole branch was hit once, but then the B was never covered and the C line was covered. Um, in general, I would recommend always using that, but it's slower than line coverage. So if you do anything like in production monitoring, you might not want to use it. Um, it also has still, it's not perfect, like it doesn't cover things like or equal. So you can get around uh, coverage by saying, oh, this or or race. And then it's like, oh, this line is covered, I'm done. But if you write it as unless, then you're not covered. Uh, same goes for default parameters where it just doesn't get it and it just always assumes it's covered. Uh, one nice addition from Ruby 2.6 is one-shot coverage. So this is very nice because it it removes the performance penalty of coverage calculations. So you, um, so the first time you execute the code, so the first time a line is hit, it removes the, the C-level hooks that track all this coverage. So you basically, you pay your penalty once and then everything after is free. So it's really nice if you do product, uh, production level monitoring because usually you don't care for how often your code get hit, you just care for like, this is dead code and this is still used. Uh, sadly, there's no one-shot branches, but maybe that comes later. Uh, one-shot coverage um, looks a little strange. It basically, it, it, uh, it's not the same format as the other coverages. It tells you like what lines were covered. Um, that is sadly very bad for automation because you can't tell if something was not covered or if it's uncoverable. For example, in this here, the else is just like, it's not covered, but doesn't mean that there's code we should have coverage for, so you can't really calculate coverage percent, and you can't alert users and tell them like, you need coverage for that. It's like, that's kind of sad, and hopefully we get a better parser for that. Uh, performance overhead is in like, if you do very simple Ruby stuff, it's like 50% for lines, 100% for branches. That's basically what I found in my benchmarks. There was a Ruby Kagi 2017 where they had even worse benchmarks. So either it got faster or I'm doing something simpler. Uh, for real, uh, real world applications, usually you don't see the overhead that much. So you can just turn it on and hope for the best. It depends on what your app does and how much like blocking IO you do. Um, yeah, and that's from the 2007 slide. So that was like terrible. So quick recap, we have line coverage, Branch coverage, which is much better, uh, looks kind of weird in format, but super useful. Uh, we have got one-shot lines, which is fast, but hard to automate. And then we always get like the result or peak result. So next is the actionable code coverage itself. And we'll go with the mindset, the problems, the solutions, and the migration. So the mindset for actionable code coverage, basically you say code coverage is, is not a metric, it's just like, uh, you can't use it as a metric because it's super easy to cheat on. So I can do, oh, this is not covered, so I'll do or equal, or like basically exploit it, or I'll only write unit tests, and then all the unit tests work, but that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't capture the use cases you're actually trying to solve. Um, and you basically can end up with 100% coverage, but that doesn't mean your tests are any good. So your tests are more like cement to your codes. Like you can't change your code now, but you have great coverage. So that's, that's basically not the goal. And so basically what, what the, the goal is basically that you have, you treat coverage as a helper. It's like basically someone sitting beside you and saying, shouldn't you write a test for this? Or you make a PR and someone comments, like where's the test for that? And basically you don't want to be the person on a PR that says like, where's the test for that? You want someone else to say like, oh, your PR failed. Oh, there you see, you should have had a test for that. And it also basically is, is, is someone who looks over your shoulder and says, you need this rescue, you need this else clause. And what happens if this condition actually gets hit? Um, I used this a bunch and I, I got a bunch of errors where it's like, why is this not covered? And I'm like, oh, my test case is bad. Like my test case goes in the same condition twice and I just, or I had code that's never reachable. So it's like, it's a nice companion that just helps you like, this is where your test doesn't cover something. So it's like basically treat it as a friend and not like as your enemy. Um, the problems with current coverage tools, for example, uh, SimpleCov are, or like uh, you have code climates, um, shops like these that you basically wait for a PR hook, which is like the, the, the worst thing you can basically have. You, you push your code, you go wait for five minutes, and you're like, oh, there's some line that's not covered, so you repeat this step all over again. Or you have to open a browser, or do all, or you have to run all your tests, 
which can be super slow if you have a giant um, code base. And basically that just adds frustration and it's not very actionable. So you also end up with a state where you can never reach 100% coverage because you always have some setup code or some edge cases where you don't have 100% coverage. So you end up in this like bike shedding where it's like 80% is fine, 90% is fine. But basically you want to say, I want 100% and then if there are exceptions, I, uh, I want to say like this line is not covered because it's not reachable or because I don't care because this is not security critical, it's just a nice feature like something like that. So basically not, you always have like this 100% and then you document your exceptions. Um, also usually the setup is very complicated. So you have to install webhooks, you have to pay providers, you have to get accounts for everyone so they can actually see what the results are. And uh, sometimes you get errors and you can't reproduce them locally. So basically the solution to all this nonsense is that we want quick atomic development feedback. You run a single file, it tells you this file is covered or like this file is not covered and if we only operate on a single file, we also get a very good runtime overhead. And if your PRs actually fail instantly, then you get this feedback, oh, you should have run this locally and then you would have noticed immediately. So you get a super fast development cycle. And you encourage this development feedback where you actually do work locally instead of waiting for PRs to fail. Um, also, if you have any gaps, you introduce them explicitly. So it's not like, I'll just not add the test case for, case for this and hope that nobody that reviews the PR will notice. But you actually say, this section is uncovered. So you call out that you couldn't cover this for, and maybe you say why, but the reviewers explicitly see and they don't have to like sanity check your code against your tests and see what branches you got. And you basically, you avoid this whole like broken window syndrome where your code seems perfect because everything's covered and what's not covered is actually documented. And everybody who introduces like a gap feels like, okay, I should have added a test, like I shouldn't add a new gap. Um, also, of course, we want branch coverage because uh, most common tools only support line coverage and that only goes so far. And uh, we need a piecemeal migration approach because if you have a large code base, it's really hard to add any kind of like new paradigm that's like, everybody should use this now and it's just, everybody stop developing for a month while I convert all this code base, so that doesn't work. And basically we want a simple local free f setup because nobody wants a complicated remote paid setup. Um, so the tool I'm showing you today, there's, there's a few out there, but this is my favorite, is uh, single cuff. It basically, it runs your test and it shows you there's your coverage gaps. And you can then either accept that and say, okay, I know these lines aren't covered because X, Y, Z, or you can fix them. Uh, it works with mini tests and RSpec, and it just catches your coverage locally without having to jump through browsers and remote setups and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and it calls out the exact location. So you can see it calls out uh, line 23 and line 22, character 10 to 14. So it's like an if or an unless that that's not covered. Um, it has a few other advantages. So for example, it's very fast. Uh, so it has, because it only works on single files, it has a very low runtime overhead. It also doesn't have to build a giant HTML report at the end of every test. So it just, you ran this file, let me look at the coverage. There you go, it's green or it's not green. Um, and in combination with forking test runner, which I'll show you later, it also makes your local setup always be in sync with your like run all CI setup. Um, it's very easy to opt in, so you can just uh, install the gem and then require it in your test helper and then say in this single file, this is covered now. Like this is like, this is my line of defense. This is my file. For example, you have a like security critical file or you're just like, I'm adding this new class and I want to make this perfect. So you just say, this file is covered, I'm done. And basically it's nice and clean and if there's any coverage gaps, it will uh, fail your test. And it's only your area you can like, maybe your team supports it or you only edit for security critical things but you can basically go piecemeal through your court base and improve things without um, blocking everybody else from getting work done. Um, 
you can also, if you want a, a more global approach, you can, uh, you can basically nail down the current coverage. So you can basically, uh, um, single cuff in, um, has a bootstrap script that goes through all your files, runs them, and then says, this has 10 lines missing, this has 15 lines missing, and puts the comments into these files. So nobody can, or basically everybody who adds new code that's not covered will get like this nice warning of like, hey, you added like these two new lines of uncovered code. So it's a nice stop the bleeding, and, but you don't have to wait for everybody to agree on uh, or fix coverage. You just like stop the bleeding, every new line gets an error, existing lines are, existing lines are exempt. Um, there's basically two, uh, two ways of configuring what's allowed uncovered, so you can just have the uncovered count, um, which is a nice like go, uh, catch all where you just, okay, two lines, three lines, five lines, um, but if you want to dive deeper and just say like this exact line is not covered, you can add an uncovered comment and makes it more easier for PR review to see like what's not covered and why you're not covering it. Um, also includes helpers that allow you to say I want coverage for all files, and I want tests for all files. Um, there's also a Go version for this. Um, it's basically a very simple concept of just like run this file, look at the coverage, fail if it's not there. So you're welcome to like build it for any other language. Um, I'm scared of real demos, so um, this is just like a recorded demo. Um, I randomly picked a project and a file because. I tried introducing this in so many projects and I would say half of them just rejected and said like, I don't like code coverage. And the other half is like, oh God, I didn't know we had so many gaps. So it's like, it's, it's something, um, I started in a bunch of projects where like I maintain them or I start contributing to them. I make like this one file change, like, hey, how do you like this? And either they accept it or they say, I don't want it. But most of the time they find like, yeah, we had like giant gaps where like, this if and this else weren't covered because nobody did like branch coverage before. Um, yeah. So I picked this obscure project and a single file from them and the set was basically just install a gem, bundle, go to a directory and then say, this is now covered and since the real structure is a little weird, you had to like uh, say, okay, my root folder is like the folder ones out. But for normal projects, the setup is just like set up and you're done. And um, it basically also reminds you that your test structure is bad because it, it tries to guess like where the file under test should be. And if, it, if it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, so basically your, your test folder should map your lib folder. And if it's not, it's like, what are you doing? Like, why is it not there? So, it encourages you to have a good test structure and a good um, test folder layout because ultimately that makes contributing to your project easier. If someone can open the user file and then, like go to the user test and ta-da, it works. So it encourages that, but you can override it and tell it like, okay, no, look for this file there. And some editors, you can also do the command shift T like RubyMine where it just flips you between code and test. So it makes all this work nicely. And for uh, active support, I picked like the memory store because I worked on that before. And it basically, it runs a test and then usually the test would pass, but now the test fails because there's uncovered lines. So the output looks something like this, where it's like, there's a bunch of lines that are uncovered and then there's three conditionals where like one of the branches was uncovered. And there's things like these that are like, you get this a lot with like very trivial and you can argue about like, do you need to cover this? Because like this is this is nonsense, it's not code. So for this, you can either just say this is uncovered, or you add a test that just says it returns true. Like takes you 10 seconds to write a test, takes you two seconds to add a comment. So just comment it. And you also call out to other contributors that don't put any logic here or assume this works. Like I'm, I haven't actually tested this. Then there's things like this where it's like nobody thought about testing this because it's very simple. But this can be like super annoying if you try to debug something, so you're like, oh, I'll try to inspect this object, or you raise an exception and the exception calls inspect, and suddenly there's a bug in here, and you just get a giant exception overload of like, you don't even know what's going on because raising the exception raises another exception, and you don't know where you are and what's going on. So it's, it's nice to have tests for these, and nobody usually thinks about this. Um, other things that are very untested is just like this, this whole method. 
It's like there's a synchronize in there, so someone thought about concurrency, but there's no tests. Who knows if it works? Should have a test. Like, why not? And there's a bunch of these one-liners where it's just like caught the, um, just like the, the if was never executed. So someone put this test there, but they didn't test the behavior. Or maybe they had the test initially, but now this condition is no longer reachable, or someone refactored the test and didn't update the code, or someone refactored the test and thinks it still works, but it doesn't actually. So this is a very nice case where if you had perfect coverage before and you change your code and suddenly your test might still be green, but you will see, hey, you lost coverage. So maybe your tests still work and you can just delete this code now, or you think your tests work and they actually don't. So it's, this is like, again, this nice, it's just a body on your shoulder that tells you, hey, look at this, this is weird. Like, why is this that way? Uh, made a PR for this. I, I don't have big hopes for this getting merged, but um, take a look, support it, do your own. And it's, it's super easy for small projects. For bigger projects, it's also doable, like piecemeal. And again, you can say, we'll do the off backend, or we'll do the security or the cookie serialization or anything that's like super critical and then move from there. And then everybody who does a new class can opt in and say, I, I want this or I don't want this. Uh, so recap is basically, we want fast, local, free feedback with marked uncovered, so you can say this is uncovered, take care of this. Um, if you use single calf, try using forking test runner, which makes your coverage atomic per file, which uh, avoids a bunch of edge cases I don't want to go into right now. And either stop the bleeding and then fix everything, or do the divide and conquer where you just say, this is my area, or this is my new class, I'm gonna make this nice, and then just use it for that. And yeah, add it to your gems, add it to your small projects. It's easy to add, easy to get started. Um, first to done, and now at the hacked fork coverage. So why do we need to hack fork coverage? The problem is that forking actually resets, um, resets all your coverage. And if you, if you run all tests, you, you share the coverage of all your files. So usually you want to know that your user test tests the user and not, oh, maybe the user controller or the user integration test. Like you want to know that the, the user test itself tests all your code because maybe the user integration test hits all your code, but it doesn't mean actually you test it. There might be no assertion, just like it hit that code, but should it be hitting this? Like, is this true or false? Like, what's the outcome? So basically you want your unit tests to cover what it's actually testing. You want your controller test to cover your controllers and not like, oh, the integration test tests the model maybe, who knows where this comes from. Just always run all tests to see what the coverage, or you want like atomic coverage from unit tests to your actual things under a test. Um, um, Pre-forking, to, to achieve this, you need um, forking and the forking test around jump does like a pre-fork to speed up things. Um, you basically, you don't want to boot up your app every time to run like all the tests. If you have 100 tests, you don't want to boot up 100 Ruby processes and be like, run this test, run this test. So basically, you load everything and then fork, run the test, fork, run the test, fork, run the test. Uh, the advantage of forking also means that you avoid any kind of pollution. So if one of your test files maybe resets some global state or defines a class, it doesn't matter. It's just like every test is isolated to itself. So you reduce these like random CI failures where it's like this class was already defined or something was modified over here and then I have to run this other thing. So your, your tests itself are always limited to this, to this one test file. So if you have any random bugs, you know it's in this test file. It's not like in another file to fold this over that um, modified it. So the, the problem with forking coverage is that uh, forking um, resets your coverage count. So I'm not sure who thought of this great feature, but it's like it's just like it wipes everything. I'm not sure who wants that, but I definitely don't want that. So basically if you want to, the, the situation you always have is you load your framework, you load your outsides, then you fork and you run a test. But you can't, inside of your fork, you can't be, oh, I'll just redo all my requires to get like this extra coverage of like this method got defined because 
uh, you only can require once. So you have to, would have to um, do some monkey patches that we just learned in the previous talk to actually get the requires to execute twice, but that's, that's not a nice thing to do. So basically we want to inherit the coverage from the parent into the child. And one way of doing this, this is basically what uh, Forking Test Runner does, but it does it a little bit more elegantly and it handles all the edge cases. It's basically you, you get uh, the peak result, store it, uh, you fork, you run your tests, and then you get the results again and merge them with the coverage you had before. And then in your fork, you're like, this is my total coverage. So it adds everything up. Um, yeah, that's basically what forking test drivers because it's just like dash dash merge coverage. So it, it takes care of all this and it works very nicely with single cut together to get this like perfect coverage for every file, but atomic to every file. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, already said that. Oh uh, yeah, forking test run also preloads active record fixtures and stuff like that and helpers. So you can customize it and make it like perfect. So you have this cutoff point of like run my tests, basically when they're done with all the global setup. And the future basically needs one shot support, but one shot is not automatable at the moment. So that might come at some point. The other way of approaching um, forking coverage is that you basically combine the coverage in the parent. So you, you run your parent, you fork, and then just basically open the pipe to your fork, do the test in your fork, and then send your coverage back to your parent, and then combine the coverage inside of the parent. So this can be useful if you have um, some kind of framework where um, your tests are very brittle or your tests do some kind of global state change and you still want to execute them. So then you would say, okay, fork, do this crazy state change or do whatever you want to do and send me back the coverage and then add it to my coverage and then give me a report. Uh, so recap is basically um, forking coverage don't play nice, so we have to work around them. Uh, use peak result to do like these in-between results and combine multiple results and you can use a pipe to send coverage around your processes. Um, leave us with the next step, which is like the, the tools we still need to make coverage better. Um, so as I mentioned before, like um, one-shot coverage is not great because it's not automatable. So we need something else that tells us, um, like we want Boolean results. We want like true, false, nil. So we want to know um, this is actually not covered and it's the user's fault or this is not covered and that's just the Ruby VM. Uh, one shot branches would be amazing. That would be super nice to have a busy start of your production server, turn on one shot branches so you pay the first time a request gets executed, you pay a little overhead, but every other request pays nothing. And then you basically hit all your servers and say, give me your current coverage. You add this all up in a giant hash and then you know, this branch has never hit, this controller has never hit, this user model method. Maybe it says it, maybe it's great, but nobody uses that. So it's a really nice way of um, getting all the information, combining them, and then knowing what can I remove or what's not needed, or maybe what's like dead code. Um, uh, as mentioned before, we need coverage and forks. So it would be nice to not have to do this all hackery and just say, hey, if you fork, just don't throw away all the coverage. That would be nice. Coverage for default parameters is nice because uh, with like keyword arcs and also with like the normal Ruby default parameters, there's a lot of things you can do in default parameters. You can say, if this is not given, call this method. If this is not given, it's like this or that. So you can put all kinds of logic there and it's basically not covered at the moment. So it would be nice to get uh, some insight into that to say, this was like someone called it without defaults or with defaults and you know that the defaults you're using are actually make sense. We often, oftentimes in tests you end up with like filling out everything because you know how the API works, but it's nice to know that, okay, if someone just calls this method without any of the other inputs, they still work. Uh, and again, um, coverage for Boolean operators would be great that you know like I hit all these cases. So for example, you have a long Boolean condition then you could have like 10 to 20 things in there that you just like all check. But you don't have any code coverage for this. You just like, this Boolean condition was hit once. So it would be nice to have an option to break this down and say, 
hey, you don't need this condition because that never happens. Maybe it duplicates something earlier or maybe it's just like impossible to hit. And the, the ultimate feature for code coverage is basically path coverage, which means you have all the combinations that you can go through your code. So here, for this like little piece of code, you would basically have four paths. So you have one, three, one, four, two, three, and two, four. So this is like super annoying overkill, so I don't want to have to implement it in any of my projects. But if you have like some like device or some kind of like authentication library where like, hey, if a user is like, doesn't have a password and logs in with a blank password, then maybe they shouldn't be authenticated and stuff like that. So it's like, for some cases, I bet this is super useful to say, okay, yeah, like every possible combination was tested at least once, or I know like it blows up or it raises or it does something expected. So, because this is super hard to track down if you have a bunch of conditions that combine uh, with each other and then know like, did I actually reach all these states? So it's like, there's like a big blind spot that a lot of libraries have and it would be great to automate this. Um, yeah, and then also the ability to turn coverage on after you already loaded code. So that might be hard to implement, but it would be nice to say, okay, my app server is already running, my app has already started, um, I want to inspect coverage when I run this method or when I do this one request. Uh, I saw a few gems that work around this by using the C-level API of coverage. Uh, for example, Coverband that, that, did that. Um, they felt a little hacky, maybe they work out, but basically some way of saying, I already have my code loaded, just tell me what, what the coverage is that I'm doing now. That would be nice. So recap is automated one-shot, one-shot branches, inherent coverage, default parameters, logical operators, uh, path coverage, and coverage uh, for preload modules. And uh, my call for you is basically cover a file today, like try it out, um, do it on what, whatever like the, your toy project is or like what your most critical session controller is or user backend or whatever you have, like try it out, see if you actually have the kind of coverage you think you have and if your test is actually doing all the things you think they're doing. We have time for questions, seven, eight minutes. Uh, so you introduced uh, rather a uh, single curve, right? Yes. Single curve, and you mentioned like there are several, uh, a few other gems which basically does uh, similar same things. Uh, yeah, I saw recently, so, like two months ago, there was like the cover gem, which does something similar. Uh, it's kind of a similar approach where it, it it runs your tests and then it tells you hey, you didn't cover this, and it also gives you like code excerpts and something like that. So I didn't look too deeply into it, but it looked like it does almost the same, but I wasn't confident that it, that it covers like all the edge cases. And I'm super happy with single cover as it is, and I don't need like my code excerpts because I just have to open my editor anyway, so I didn't really look into that deep. But I, I bet there's more out there, and I saw it for other languages too, that they have similar tools that don't make you open HTML files to see what your coverage is. Okay, so. So, so else, like, what, what, what's the major uh, advantages, benefits from using single curve uh, instead of other uh, GMs or tools? So the, the other major tools I saw are basically what, whatever um, code climate does, I bet they use a simple curve. And basically their, their big downsides are that they're slow because they have to generate this giant report. Um, they always need you to run your whole repository. So you never get fast feedback. If you have a big app, you like go run everything, come back in an hour and then see what your coverage is. So that, that doesn't scale, that doesn't work. And they're basically remote paid setups, so I don't want to pay for anything. I want like fast, free, local setup. Um, and they don't support branch coverage. So branch coverage is pretty essential if you use any kind of like end of line modifier where you like raise unless or do this unless, do this if, or any uh, tannery operator you want this like, did I hit both branches? Because otherwise it's just like, why are you doing it? Like you can just cheat and move everything on a single line and then line coverage will tell you this line is totally covered and then you're good. Thank you.
Hello. Uh, I want to ask if it's possible. Like, could you go back to in the beginning of your talk? You mentioned there's some overhead turning on this kind of gyms or coverage thing, and I I'm coming from another like perspective. It I want to ask if it's possible. Yeah. This one. Yeah, since the overhead is so small, I'm thinking I'm, I I want to turn it down in the production environment. I would say totally go for it. Like, have a look at your performance numbers, basically, but just turn it on, let your servers run, uh, make an endpoint that just returns coverage to peak result, and then just see what you get. But basically, look look for the performance. It, it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a bunch of I/O, it shouldn't be a problem. But if you do like any like tight Ruby algorithms, there might be overhead. So uh, do I get it? So when do, when will it generate a report? So it's like keep generating, updating the report so I can always get the latest yeah. status? OK, cool. But you basically have to, so what you should be doing is you run all your servers, basically you start them and you come back like 24 hours later. Yes. And then you just hit the endpoint, but you make sure that you hit all of your servers once because they will have different coverage results. OK. And then you just combine them and say like, OK, there's like zero, one, one, zero. So okay, I'll combine the two or two or two or one or whatever. Just so you know, like okay, this is not covered. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.